you know, when I was younger, I played video games and I like, sure. I would get like, that was one thing that I noticed was that I really would think that they were re I would feel like they were really important. Yeah. No, yeah. this is a really important thing that I need to do. Like I need, I really need to finish this. Like really let me do it, you know? And it's like, wow, no, there's nothing important there, but it absolutely makes you feel like it's the most important thing on earth. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Royal Path. I am your host, Andrew, and I have to ask Cyprian and Father Turbo, is a hot dog a sandwich? No, a hot dog is a hot dog. And oh, no. oh no, because there are sandwiches that have hot dogs on them. Oh, interesting. Okay. But a hot dog is a hot dog. Right. If you say to someone, I want a hot dog, you'll get a bun with some sort of sausage of some yeah. kind, hot dog thingy, right? But there's 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 like uh, these beach sandwiches. My dad used to make these beach sandwiches. He's from Santa Monica, right? And it's like rye, it's like a sandwich, rye bread, yeah. mustard, whatever, but the dog is split. It's grilled yeah, and split. Dog. Yep, I know right? exactly what you're talking about. Yep. But it's a sandwich. No one calls it a hot dog. Although That's right. the meat in there is a hot dog. So emphatically, no, a hot dog is a hot dog. And but a sandwich. if you were to walk up to someone and say, give me a Reuben, they're going to give Reuben, you. A Reuben's a sandwich. A Reuben's yeah. a sandwich. But they're going to give Reuben you. has nothing to do with a hot dog. Yes. But what I'm saying is, I think your argument is based off that if you were to walk up and say, give me a hot dog, Joe, uh, I'll give you a hot dog. But if you were to walk up and say, give me a BLT, they're going to give you bacon, lettuce, and tomato and mayonnaise on between two pieces of bread. Well, here's the, so, here's the question. It, you don't put anything else in a hot dog bun. This is why I'm going to lean towards Father Turbo on this. Because a, a hot dog sandwich could be nothing more than bologna between two pieces of bread. And it's but still, not a hot dog bun. But not a hot dog bun. And I, I feel like... I think, I think a sandwich is a piece of bread yes with meat between it but is it any bread but is it any bread or is it specifically like sandwich type of is it does it have to be i don't i don't know no I don't, no no no, no, no. Hold, on, dog, hold on a hot dog is a hot dog I a think. hot dog is a hot dog and and this is the thing that's <clears throat> this is one of those things this is where these postmodernists. this is where they brought us to where we don't understand that's what it comes down to. Right. That's and like, no, I mean, I, I mean, if we're having an <laughs> honest discussion, right? If we're having yep. an honest discussion, everyone knows a hot dog is a hot dog. That, I, I agree, mean, agree with that. Right? Is a hamburger a sandwich? So here's what's interesting about that. A hamburger is a hamburger, but a hamburger could be conflated with a sandwich in a way that a hot dog could not. I agree with that. Oh, well, here's Andrew. I think this is, I think I can settle this. A sandwich is something between two slices of bread. Okay. A hot dog bun is not two slices of bread. A hot dog bun is one piece of bread. So you're saying that if the bottom of that bun gets a little bit soggy with the ketchup as it does and it splits, and it's now two pieces no, of bread. That's, that's just no, no, no. That's a malformed. Nope, that's a malformed and misfunctioning hot dog. Yeah, so, and I can even prove Cyprian's point even more. Go for because it. Because you can take the hot dog and take one piece of bread and curl it up. That's not a hot dog. Oh no, that's a hot dog. That's oh, a with hot one, dog. With one piece of bread. With one, one piece, piece of bread. Yes. Okay, one take, piece of bread. Take, okay, like here's it. a flat piece of bread, right? Here's I'm the hot it. dog. You curl it <laughs> up because I. If anyone has children, you've done this before. Of course. You, 
you've made a hot dog out of one piece of bread. You just sure. curl it up. There you go. It's a hot dog. Any child knows that's a hot dog. I agree. No child's going to say, oh, that's a sandwich. No, no, no. Right? A kid comes and says, I want a sandwich. Right? Whatever. Two pieces of bread. Whatever, you know what I mean? Two pieces of bread. So then, is a euro a sandwich? No. A euro is a euro. Yeah, it's a euro. I mean, I mean, I'm just saying, like, so. I but it's know. one piece of bread. I, it's I a pita, no right? It's just one piece of bread in a euro. Andrew, a euro. Andrew, I have no horse in this race. Andrew, I have no, Andrew, I have no hot dog in this bun. Andrew, you're playing the devil's game. <laughs> I'm you're playing, playing the devil's game. I'm playing the game of let's have an interesting opener for a podcast that I have. I love it. I think but, I think it's great. And I think we'll get a lot of uh, we'll get a lot of comments on this, but I'm I'm pretty dead set on mine. I like it. Actually, goes down. It goes down a rabbit hole, and I don't have like the culinary like uh, uh, I don't know what word I'm going to use. I don't have the culinary expertise because you can actually start getting into um, okay, what is bread? And if you're doing bread, like then is a burrito a sandwich? Is a pizza absolutely a not sandwich? Is a taco a sandwich? Absolutely not. I think that's where no. Anybody so who wants to go I down think, that route, I think a I'm lot of your guys is a lot of your guys's opinions are based off of that. It's if it's one piece of bread, then it's become separate from the sandwich family. If, no, you know, I, no, no, because okay. if you have, <clears throat> if I have a bunch of roast beef and squirt, squirt some mustard and like put a slice of Swiss cheese in one piece of bread and fold it up. I don't consider that a hot dog. Right. I, I, I don't see. Is it a sandwich? Is it a sandwich? Is a sandwich? It's a sandwich. Is that a sandwich? It's a sandwich, right? Oh, that's a good point. Philly cheesesteak. Philly cheesesteak is one piece of bread. Right. It's a sandwich, right? So, so the thing is, you have to understand that what we're talking about is the hot dog itself sausage sausage right yep. with the proper right the bun the proper bun and if the bun is a makeshift bun out of a single piece of bread because we're talking about the sausage that's what makes it a hot dog right but it's like i know someone out there i know there's well maybe not i'm hoping out there there's some really adept philosophical guy who's like Yes, because it's two antecedents connected to the whatever. You know what I mean? I, I just know, I just know that there is this one particular portion, which is a hot dog, right? And mm -hmm. when this, there's, this is like a logical syllogism, right? There's one, there is the hot dog and then there is the bun. But the bun yeah. without the hot dog is still a bun, not still necessarily a hot dog, a hot dog right? But it's a hot dog bun. Yes, but it doesn't have to be a hot dog bun. It can be a, pe a piece of bread, true. which true. can de facto become hot dog bun because of the hot dog, right? But if there's no hot dog and it's just salami or just like roast beef, then it's a sandwich. Is, is the sausage without, if you have a, so if you have the Frank, right? You have the sausage, the Frank. And uh, this no is my bun, next question. And there's no bun. Is that still a hot dog? Or is that a wiener? Or a Frank or whatever. Like, how do we? Which See, which this is, is the hot the dog other only end of that scale? This is the other end of that road that you're walking. This this dangerous dangerous path you're walking, Father. Jared. No, I think we can answer this one too. Forgive me, but a hot dog, right? So, for instance, like you're having a quote unquote cookout, right? Yes. Oh, who wants a brat? Right. right? Okay. A brat's interesting, right? Because a brat will typically be served on a bun, but sometimes on its own, right? Yep. Yep. But a brat is not a hot dog. That's right. That's true. Right? If, if I said I'm going to give you a hot dog and I gave somebody a brat, they'd be they'd like, be like I, "This is not yeah. what I wanted. I wanted yeah. a hot. Did you have any hot dogs?" Exactly. Hot right. dog is all those weird portions of, of meat, right? Of of which, yes. right? But unless you're getting into the um, what are the ones? Uh, the kosher ones, whatever, where they're all beef. Yep. Yep. Right? All beef cut. yep. So other than that, I mean, that's what a hot dog is, right? So a hot dog is not a brat, and a brat is not a, a, a hot dog. Interesting. But, uh, but, yep. <laughs> and what, well, uh, 
is a hot dog a taco? No. No. Not? no. I am saying. I mean, I hear what I'm hearing is. Although you can make a hot dog into a taco, but a hot dog is not a taco. The way you would make a hot dog into a taco is you would take that disgusting hot dog meat, chop it up. You, you would chop it up mm-hmm. and put it in either a flat round flour or corn tortilla or in a hard shell with yeah. the appropriate southwestern latino mm-hmm. flavoring and there yeah. is a hot dog and there and is taco. this and the hot process dog. of you chopping up this hot dog right chopping up the hot dog at what point <laughs> does it stop being a hot dog it doesn't because you would serve it and say here is a so hot dog taco because hot dog listen hot dog meat is a particular meat yeah like this is like these these actually these are objective there's objective answers to this there's not really opinions because there are there are certain recipes to make something a hot dog versus a bratwurst yes Mm -hmm. and you can chop up and do whatever you want like people they'll say oh it's a wiener right but mm-hmm. ultimately they're chopping up hot dogs and putting them in the pork and beans, right? Like you don't okay. chop up bratwurst and put it in the pork and beans, right? You chop up wieners, which are really hot dogs, right? But there's a particular meat process. Yeah. Which I don't know what it is specifically, but I know enough to know there's a specific thing that you have to do to make something a hot dog, right? And you can chop it up and put it in a taco and good for you, it'd be disgusting, but... It would it would be hot dog meat in a taco, just like you know hot dog taco, hot dog taco, right? This is actually a this is actually a much more profound conversation than somebody listening from I mean, outside. It, I think it really it's, speaks to like it really speaks to like postmodernism. I it mean, does. It, it it's really like breaking down definitions of being like, well, is it really right? Like, right. okay, come right. on. It, and you know what? My actual stance is a hot dog is a menu item. When you order a hot dog, you're not ordering a sandwich. You're ordering, that's my actual, I'm no longer playing devil's advocate here. When I go to the Costco and I order a hot dog, I know what I'm getting. It's, it's, it's the hot dog between a hot dog bun. It's yeah. the core component of ingredients to, you know, this is, this is people having just a little bit too much time on their hands, which is fine. I love these arguments. There's nothing See, wrong with I, it. It's, but, but I think it's important because like 200 years ago, no one in Western society would ever entertain that conversation for even a second, because there's not even a question about the difference between a hot dog and a sandwich. It's only in the last hundred years with a concerted effort by a certain, by certain groups that actually want to confuse people as to what reality is mm-hmm. that we that we and we're also steeped in it that we're even like that we can have these conversations mm-hmm. i think like 150 years ago people would have been like what do you no a sandwich is a sandwich and a hot dog is a hot dog and that's it mm-hmm. like I there's think, no there's no question right. that's right. i figured what it was but c.s lewis wrote an essay about this it's not about hot dogs but it's about something somebody mm. used an adjective incorrectly in one of their mm-hmm. essays and then he pointed it out. And then the person was like, well, if you really think about it. And then C.S. Lewis is like, okay, we're done. Like, this is the death of the English language. Like, we're now talking in such a way where it's like, okay, we're going to start being like, well, does it really mean that? Is this really, which is like almost, if I'm, Father, forgive me if I go too far. This is just my, it's almost luciferic. Because it almost comes down to this whole idea of like questioning core essential truths and being, well, does it really mean, can we? Can we break it down farther than that if we dissect? Oh, that's the, that's the, uh, Andrew, you've just given the perfect segue to where we're at in the creed. Which I would think would be so cool if we had been able to do according to the scriptures this week. Because I was we just are, saying, that's thinking, what we're doing. That's what we're doing this week. Oh, I thought that was Peterson. I thought we were doing in Rose from the Dead uh, and three days later. We can do it yeah. in according to the scriptures. That's fine. I thought that, that according to the scriptures was Peterson, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, no, 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 no. And, uh, and on the third day he rose, he, and, and on the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, right? Yeah. So I had thought we had jumped to according to according to scriptures yeah. with just in conversation. We can certainly revisit it because I mean it obviously deserves being revisited. But well, before we if, go, who has please. the best within a ten mile radius? Who has the best hot dog? It's like that you guys could go out and be like, I want a really good hot dog. What restaurant are you going to to get one? 
You're Nowhere. not going. To, you're not going to a restaurant for a hot dog in Saipan. No. You're gonna oh, make. That's true. I've got a. I've got an outside kitchen right there that I'm looking at, and I'm gonna grill it. And father oh, has father has been here to my little outside outdoor kitchen, and I have a grill, and I'm gonna grill it. Yeah. That's how it's gonna happen. That's yeah. how it's gonna go. Down. I was just trying to figure out a way to say I really like Costco's hot dogs. They're really really good. So. Well, if I was back in LA, it would be Pink's for sure. But besides that, I don't know of any place that I would just go and get a hot dog. Costco's got good hot dogs. I'm not going to lie about that. They do have good. We actually, we have, we, we, you know, we have a, something that used to be a Costco and they kept the hot dogs here. They still, have the, <laughs> they still have the hot dog window and people still get them here. So you can get a Costco hot dog here, but they have no more Costco. Welcome to Saipan. We just do so, it like that. So then the first time that I noticed visibly or like to the point where it actually kind of got me thinking was when I was still cooking in kitchens and they were <laughs> taking these hundreds of year old recipes and changing them and still calling it the same thing. And so I can't remember what this particular menu item was, but I was talking to a chef at the time and he said, uh, I'll just pick something random. He'll okay. Cause it was a brunch restaurant it, hollandaise. We'll say hollandaise. And for hundreds of years say, this is not true. I'm just throwing out an example that you use lemon juice. So you use lemon juice as a way to accent the hollandaise, which is essentially just egg yolk and butter. And then mm -hmm. you throw in lemon juice to accent it. And then he would say something along the lines of, in this made up conversation, he would say, well, I actually use cranberry juice, but I still call it hollandaise. You know, or, you know, I use the whole egg. I don't just use the yolk, but I still call it hollandaise. And he's like, yeah, we're really at a time. And he said this, this is the real part is he said, we're really at a time where we're taking at these old recipes and we're really like deciding, like, are these even, can we like revamp these and call these the same thing? And like, I remember at the time being like, oh, that's a really interesting thought. And then not really thinking about it anymore. But now that I'm sitting here thinking about it, now I'm thinking about it five years later. I sit, I'm kind of like, well, I don't know if we really can call them that we can call it like a twist on that because it's like, it's a, it's like a perversion. It's, it's trying to like make, it's trying to like shoehorn something in that's like not that. Well, and, especially sauces, dude, you can't sauces is the like French cooking. You try to change a sauce, forget about it. Like it's yeah. not, it's not going to happen. Not going to happen. Like you can't change what you if you're if you change the sauce, you have to change the name. If you change the ingredients, you have to change the name. Yeah, which is but that the whole argument is: Do you really have to? You know, which all brings us back to the creed, which is, and on the third day rose again according to the scripture. So, with that, go. <laughs> I don't have any. I I I expended all my mental energy with the hot dog conversation. Well, this is. This is where I, I think it, in some ways it goes back to, I mean, look, I was under the same delusion about, because this, this is the tough spot, I think, even for many Protestants and the place where people want to go, like, up until this point, I think people can still get with it, right? They're like, even the virgin birth, I think a lot of people can still get with it. But there's the, the this is the point of faith, and it's the point where it's so difficult for so many people. It was difficult for me until I actually had an experience of Christ that, no, the resurrection is like, it's real. It's real. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I, I think the sad thing for me, I guess the only comment I have at this point, which, which is... The scriptures are so wonderful. For a lot of people who come into orthodoxy, they, they'll spend sometimes years away from the scriptures because they're burned out um, from you know, the kind of Protestant approach to it. Um, some people are scared because they're scared of, you know, I don't know how to interpret the scriptures, like all of these reasons that can kind of come up and become you know, a real problem. And, and I think it's important for people to understand the, the importance of the scripture. It's almost like reclaiming the scriptures properly because they don't belong to the heretics as I believe St. Irenaeus would say, 
you know, um, the, the scriptures are part and parcel of the revelation given to us, you know, and the, the inappropriate use of scripture, the inappropriate definition of scripture, and the inappropriate, um, I almost want to say the inappropriate, inappropriate place in which the scriptures are held. Um, those are all unfortunate, but they should never take away from the absolute power, beauty, um, all the things that are, I mean, the holiness of, of scripture, you know, and this gets us into this whole thing where, um, you know, talking about uh, the last episode before last we're talking about Dr. Peterson, it's like, you know, he's, he's right. And so much of what he said was right. But the, in regards to the Bible being the basis of Western civilization, it's just, he made the error in making it as the precondition for the existence. I mean, Christ, like, like it's, it's the mistaking of the pages of the book, right. With, with the son of God, the logo is the second person of the, of the Trinity like that. That's the problem. Right. So if we can kind of work past that, then we can begin to understand the scripture. And I don't know, maybe we could talk about all the great things and how to engage the scripture as an Orthodox Christian. That's something a lot of people don't think about, you know. And um... I, I, I mentioned that, and I wasn't sure if I was right. I'm still not sure if I'm right. That I think what I was trying to loop it back to, and we don't want to talk about this, but what I was trying to loop it back to is that there's this essential truth to the scripture and the luciferic aspect and again father if correct please correct me if i'm wrong comes in when it's like well does it really mean that when there is like this like objective truth and sure eternity from what i understand is uh, an aspect of it is viewing all these things from these different oh my gosh wow all these different angles all these different truths all these different facets and way of looking at it but there has to remain this core to it and taking away from that core and saying, oh, well, really what he meant by here is blah, 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 blah. When really that's not what say St. Paul meant. What St. Paul meant was da, 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 da. And somebody's coming along and saying, well, no, that's not really what he meant. What he yeah. meant was more than trying to make it like maybe more digestible, a little bit yeah, you easier know for you know, I, this is, it's like, the, it, it was a running thing for, for uh, the conversation I had earlier today. It's just kind of been a running thing for me. I mean, it's, but fundamentally, the problem with the scriptures is the, the absolute lack of humility in modern man. Mm. Um, and it's the lack of humility, which is detrimental to the ability of ever any, any proper encounter of authority and hierarchy. I mean, we're in such a bad place right now to where the the people who should get it the most, you know, Orthodox Christians, we, you know, we struggle with humility um, and, and, a, and a proper um, inner interaction with hierarchy and authority. I mean, yeah, everyone does. Sure. That's like a, that's a primordial, if you will, like human problem. But I mean, I, I can say objectively, right? This, like my generation, this generation, this modern generation, it's, it's something terrible has happened to us. You know, my, my father, I mean, let me tell you guys something. Uh, I realized this today. I realized, you know, that a lot of what I say to people I think people can get it really twisted and I'm not trying to make this about me, but I'm just saying from my own experience, people can get some things twisted and they, they, what they can forget is that even before becoming Orthodox or, or being a priest for that matter or whatever, or, you know, the other way around, um, there's an understanding I've had about respect that I just do not find common anymore. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. there's, there. I mean, people can roll their eyes. I don't really care. I, I'm just telling you. Like there's, it, it. You can tell. It kind of infuriates me a little bit, because, you know, 
I grew up in a, in a I grew up in a situation where I, I, for me, fear, respect, and love are indivisible of my father. You know what I mean? In, indivisible. And that, that spilled out into my uncles, that spilled out into my teachers, right? And, and don't get it twisted. I mean, I remember, I'll never forget Mr. Sigety. No, 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 that's Miss Sigety, forgive me. <laughs> By the way, I'm sorry, Miss Sigety, for what I did to you, my PE teacher, my uh, English <laughs> PE teacher. I'm sorry for what I did to you. But Mr. Siegel, he was, he was my seventh grade uh, science teacher. And by the way, I'm sorry, Mr. Siegel, for what we did to you. Um, but I just remember this man, you know, gosh, this good man. And uh, the, the utter, this is, this is what blew me away. The utter lack of respect. It's my first year in public school. And I was looking around and don't get me wrong. I'm no angel, whatever. But I'm looking around and I'm seeing these people just tear this teacher apart. I mean, it was my first time watching a grown man cry from being, you know, having his, you know, personhood and dignity assaulted like that. You know, I, I'd never seen that before. The way my seventh grade class just tore this guy apart for just, you know, wearing sneakers and like whatever, you know, just I'd never seen anything like it before. Right. And by the way, it's not like I was living in Caprini Green. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Like I wasn't living in like the Bronx. It was like I'm in Garden Grove. Right. And and mm -hmm. and absolute animals. No respect. No respect. And I was I sat back and it, it shocked me at first, you know, and it was one of those things where subconsciously I must as my I, I think that was one of those moments that just kind of like shock and awed me and just kind of like broke down some of my inner, inner processes. And I just kind of like started falling into that path, which is probably why my parents were like, what happened to him, whatever, but that's what they get for throwing me into public school. But anyways, like, uh, yeah, the, the absolute, I'd never seen anything like it before. Never seen anything like it before. And that's another thing too, that like just real talk, so for all of you who get who think you don't know me, I'm gonna tell you something. All my cousins, right? All my family, they were all in LA. <laughs> so 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 when I when I talk about my cousins and my interactions with them and 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 even them having respect, right? This 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 this, this wasn't Brentwood Negroes. You know what I mean? Like these were. These were folk in LA too. And that level of disrespect they didn't have. What's happening now? Mm -hmm. This is a whole new thing. And that's one of the reasons why, again, you know, this is gonna be a running quote for tonight. Forgive me, everyone. I'm on a good one, I guess. I don't care. Like, I'm telling you, something's, it's different now. Like mm -hmm. the level of disrespect, which comes from the absolute hubris. It's a disgusting, revolting, repugnant hubris that is just unfettered, unchecked, and it has caused people to go mad, go absolutely mad. Saint Ignatius Brinachinov, one of the great Russian saints, he talks about in his work, The Field, there's a chapter on there, he talks about self-accusation, right? And this is, other fathers will talk about this in regards of pride. And pride being like this fever, this madness. Everyone knows the experience. Well, maybe not everybody. But you know that person who's so proud, it's just like they can't see themselves. And it's it's almost embarrassing. You just want to be like, oh man, just shut up. Like yeah. you're, you're, you're embarrassed, you're embarrassed for, for them. Um, yeah, you're embarrassed, you're embarrassed for them. You're, you're embarrassed. Like, for I'm them. embarrassed for you right now. Yeah. You're yeah, embarrassed yeah, yeah. for them, you know? And and go ahead write your letters, but as a father on every level, right? I just sometimes want to just smack someone. Just be like, Psh, what is, you know what I mean? Because that, because that's what would have happened to me, right? Like, mm -hmm. what is wrong with you? Mm -hmm. You are absolutely deluded, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and this is, and this is the thing because I talk about this with my wife. I've talked about with this with her at times. There is a um, 
there is this mechanism that happened where like my children, God bless them. My children, no, they're good kids, whatever. But, you know, there's some, there's one in particular that shall really name this, you know, but it's just like, they start feeling themselves and it's like, ah, like what you don't realize is the reason why you're even able to feel yourself the way you are is because I'm trying to do better than what I had. Mm. I'm trying to reason with you. I'm trying to, you know, respect you and all that stuff. And I think that's a fundamental mistake that I have personally made and many of us make because what it's done is this absolute zoo that we're living in that we call the world today, that we call American society, it's come from that. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's a grave, grave error. All that it's done is engendered confusion it's engendered rebellion. It's engendered all this disorder within people, right? And so let me get off my soapbox right now because you can tell I'm hot about it, but this is why the scriptures can't really be properly approached because everybody thinks that they know, right? And people would, people would rather, it's, it's crazy. This is how crazy things are. <laughs> people would rather spend their lives in prison people would rather take the life of someone else people would rather rot their bodies right due to whatever process than, than say you know what maybe i don't know any better maybe, maybe i'm wrong right it i don't know what else to call it except for demonic i i, I don't know what else to call it when people are so suicidal you know, on an existential level that they'll drive themselves into the ground because of pride. And it's, it's all based on lies, by the way, right? So people have this apprehension of, of scripture and they will it, getting back to the book of Eli, you know, and they start writing and it's just like, well, I read this plainly, clearly, and this is how I think it's interpreted. And now you have yahoos running off, you know, forming their cults and doing whatever they're doing and just wrecking people. All because they refuse to say, maybe I don't know what this means. The, the, there's really something powerful in that. And what it's clicking off to me is this idea of like a, the separation from tradition. Mm -hmm. So, you know, because if I was to think, if somebody was to ask me, well, what's the difference in the way a Protestant would read the scriptures and the way an Orthodox person would read scriptures? Mm -hmm. I think the immediate thing that would come off in my head is, well, the Orthodox reads, and if they don't understand something, they go to the fathers. Mm -hmm. Like they go to tradition and they say, well, what are the fathers? And whereas the Protestant says, what do I think it means? Mm -hmm. Right? Like, let me read it again and let me see, like, what do I, what do I, think? Me, Cyprian, I hate to interrupt you, but I just want to, I want to, please interrupt. Chris, I was saying, not only does that, not only is that what the Protestant says, but he says, that's the only way for me to read it. Yes. It's the only way for me to read it. It would be inappropriate to go to the fathers. That's right. For them. That's and right. this week, I was having a conversation uh, with my mother, and she asked me an interesting question. She said, uh, "Who has been very supportive of my and very curious about my conversion?" Which is wonder, which has been wonderful, you know, uh, speaking with her and as I as I have through this whole process. But she she asked me an interesting question, and she said, "How has your relationship, uh, talking about with my wife, changed?" since you were married in the church right so since since you came and you you married us and uh, sanctified our marriage in the church and all of that she said well how has it changed and i it i've changed right so i've changed from that time so but in stopping and thinking about it i i stopped and thought about it and i said well it's definitely changed but it's definitely changed and as we talked through it a little bit what i ended up with was i said to her you know what feels different now or what's different is it now feels like my marriage and my family is part of like, of course, we're part of like a genetic lineage. We get that. And of course I have a family lineage and I'm Mexican. So like, you know, we're very, we have a, a great amount of pride in our families and all of that. So that's there and that's going to be there. But outside of that, there's this kind of, it now feels like, being, a, I told her like a link in a chain, but like it's the, it's, the, it's a spiritual link in a chain that like our marriage 
in the church has a different character and a different weight, right? As like that, that, that there's a, that there's a, a, res- a holy responsibility that we have now to each other, to our family, and that that then has an impact on the future. Whereas before, as I told her, it, it was very much like, well, we're starting this thing, this, you know, family together, whatnot. And it's sort of like, we're starting, we're the starting point and we can kind of do it however we want to do it. And I think that there's this, that, that was something when, when you said, you know, like what has changed in my own life? Like it clicked off for me because my parents got divorced, my mother remarried. So I had a stepfather from the age of nine and he was 20 years older than my mother. So he was from the generation before my mother. Mm -hmm. He was like her of her parents' generation. Mm -hmm. And like the way, and he was from Missouri. He was from Kirksville, right? Mm -hmm. Farm guy from out there, raised doing that type of thing. And it was like totally different. The way that I was raised. And like you say, around my father, like my dad, different generation, right? And we would reason and we would talk and that was wonderful and all of that. But like my stepfather, it was like, that's not how it's going down. I know that he had a great deal of love for my brother and I, but there was a, he was also like a strict disciplinarian. You know what I mean? But he also, like, I was working from the age of 12. He was like, you know, you want a part-time job? You want to go out and do this? And it's like, I'm so thankful that he did that. My father wouldn't have done that, right? Because it's like, well, that's not appropriate for a 12-year-old to be working. But he was like, what are you talking about? I was, I was picking corn, you know what I mean? What are you talking about? <laughs> like, right. so... Right. Yeah, and and it's and it's that and it was there was something palpable you know with him about you could feel like i had never been to missouri but i could feel missouri mm-hmm. like i could feel the tradi- and and the culture the tradition i could feel that something was passing through and that he was doing things in a a way that they were supposed to be done you know, and like, right. and that's that, and that's right. something that I felt in the Orthodox Church, you know. Right, and it, and God help us, you know, I just, I, I mean, I lament, I, I lament this, this fact, because more than just some sort of relic of a bygone era, I, I think about, you guys remember a couple of years ago, it's almost like a caricature of the the kind of hipster maker guy, you know, with the Mm -hmm. handmade apron and that, like all that stuff. Okay. Whatever. Like, I'm not talking about pining up, pining after some bygone era in regards of like, you know, just some sort of superficial aesthetic. Right. I'm talking about, I understand and know that it's fundamental to the proper ordering of a human being. And it's, and it's, I don't know how God is going to, I, I don't know how God is going to redeem things. I trust that he is. And this is probably the closest you get to me being fatalistic, but, um, you know, like we're looking at lost generations now at this point. Um, I mean, I, I experience things where the church can and does, I mean, I'm a living example of it, right? The church can and and does bring people and that's the resurrectional power of the church but the one of the things i have to be really honest with about myself and this is why it matters families matter cultures matter nations matter the way that you raise your children matter part of the reason why someone can scratch their heads at me and you know and it's that's people's own kind of misstep and and that type of superficial judgment you know it, it's very dangerous to have it but I get it. Someone can look at some things and, you know, I'm a man of my age and my era. Fair enough. Right. But the thing that they don't understand, which I'm kind of showing my hand a little bit in tonight's episode is I was raised by a man who just by proxy of his age was really the grandfather of most people I'm talking with. So maybe at this point, a great grand, great grandfather to some people. My dad was born in like 1926 or 27, something like that. You know what I mean? So I was raised by a man, and by the way, my dad was the looser of his of his siblings. <laughs> right? Speaking of siblings, <laughs> right? So, like that reality 
is super important to understand because it's what it's one of the things that's helped me to become in my in my opinion my worthless opinion but to some degree adept to orthodoxy because i already had this this kind of this bed in which i was raised of understanding authority understanding respect understanding self-control forgive me understanding humility like being able to say like i mean i don't need to fight with my dad because he's the dad i'm the kid Hmm. you know one of the things that can infuriate someone if you're a parent you know what i'm talking about and if you don't you're a liar or deluded uh forgive me like sometimes your kids will say something to you and you're like I have underwear older than you. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Like, like, how dare you even consider that this thing that we're talking about, that you're going to know more about this than me, right? I, 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 you, you, do you understand what I'm saying? You, you hit these moments and out of love, you just go, okay, sweetie, let me try to explain it to you, right? Mm-hmm. But if we pull that portion of time out, right? That portion where a child says to you, that's, you don't know what that is, daddy, blah, blah, blah. Okay, right? Imagine now a whole society of that. Imagine a whole society of that. That's where I go like, I don't, I don't, I really don't know. I've gone on record that I don't know what the heck's going to happen to millennials, that it's just, it's not good. And you're probably talking about other generations as well, but I'm pretty been pretty anti-millennial for a while because the entitlement, even in my work is prevalent everywhere. And it's like, oh, well, you know, this, this 12 step thing, that's just not going to work for me. It's like, okay, well, sure. It's only helped hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. All it requires is humility. Millions. All it, all, all it requires is just you taking a small step and realizing, oh, wait, you're not God. Mm-hmm. You know, like all that takes, but you can't do that. So instead you flock to other things and congratulations, then you get government approved heroin, you know, which is yeah. Suboxone. And, you know, you get your medically assisted treatment, yeah. which by the way, everybody says is harmless, but my brother sh- took heroin for a number of years. Heroin didn't kill him. Methadone did. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, let's all talk about how safe that stuff is. And let's all talk about how, you know, it's all so much better harm reduction. I'm getting kind of angry right now, so I'm going to calm down. But this last Sunday, Father, it's interesting that you bring that up because my last this last Sunday we have a nun at our parish, and my daughter was messing around with the like the honey by our coffee, and she was had the little switch back, and she's with another little girl, and they're playing. They didn't really know any better, and they're going to pour down on the table, and Mother walked up and said, "Don't do that," and I looked over and I saw it. And they kind of both looked at her and I said, the correct answer is yes, mother. And you turn around and you walk away. Mm-hmm. And that's the correct answer. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't, and it's like, you know, it doesn't have to do with this particular mother. It is the office in which mm-hmm. she is. It is the position that that's right. it's that's right. An orthodox nun. You listen to her, even if it's wrong, then you listen to her and you come back later and you say, you know, that's not going to be held against you later on. If like mother comes to you and says, take out the garbage. And he's like, well, I already did. It's like, doesn't matter. Take it out again. It's like, right. then take it out again. That's See, what you that do. Right there, that right there. This is another part. This is another part of the tradition that people want to excise. And those same people that want to excise that part of the tradition, they're the same ones who have no problem, you know, pouring Pepsi in the Eucharist or whatever else they're going to try to do next. Right. All the innovations, all the twisted things that happened two years ago, this comes from the people who look at that and they go like, oh, that's that backwards, superstitious, you know, patriarchal cultures. We Orthodoxy needs to get rid of that so we can catch up with the times, guys, right? That and, and those people fundamentally have no concept of an authentic spiritual life. I'm just telling you, because an authentic spiritual life fundamentally requires the level of, of humility where you recognize the problem is when you are correct. Think about what I just said there. The problem is when you are correct, right? People don't understand this concept of, I do more harm by being correct than I am 
being wrong and humble. It's better that you're wrong and humble, right? Than being correct and making sure everybody knows that you're correct, right? Yeah. Because from correctness comes all these other, right? The correctness is a temptation from the right, right? Correction is a temptation from the right, right? That's what that's what pulls you off the real path in that sense, right? And from this temptation from the right of correctness, all kinds of malformed ideas come from, right? This is in many ways what Blessed Sarah from Rose was fighting against in part of his life was people, which is kind of funny because now people, the people on the left side, they look at him as like, you know, somebody hypercorrect, but he was actually dealing with hypercorrectness. People who are disregarding the spirit of the law for the letter, right? So correctness is 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 not the thing, right? Humility is the thing. Wait, I'm sorry, Father. Back up. Yeah. Do Disregarding it. the spirit of the law for the letter. I don't understand what you mean by that. Like I'm familiar uh, with the concept, but what are you referring to? Okay, so so the 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 spirit of the law gives life, but the letter kills, right? Yeah. So in this context with with Blessed Sarah from Rose, right? Okay. Okay. He was dealing with people who were like hyper correct, right? Who were rigid in their understanding of things, right? To the point where it wasn't life giving. Right? Are you following me? Mm -hmm. Yes. He was dealing with that. I'm using that as an example where correctness, right? Is is it when I say the problem is when you're right, right? So you have a situation with someone, okay? Let's say objectively you're right. But spiritually, many times you hold him to that correctness is, is the greater problem. Mm -hmm. It causes, it's a greater problem spiritually for you to hold to your correctness in certain areas than it is to just to say, you know what? I'm going to be humble. I'm, I'm giving your, I'm, I'm pulling off of your example when you said, hey, if your spiritual father says whatever, like take the trash out, even though you already did, just do it. Or, your, or the mother, the Orthodox nun, right? Just do it because the humility of just doing the thing, right, has more benefit than saying like, well, actually, no, because sure. blah, blah, blah. Now, to be fair, we're talking about levels of obedience, but obedience still is, is the thing, right? You gain more at times seeking the path of peace than you do seeking the path of correctness because correctness oftentimes has more to do with Getting back to the scripture, well, what's more correct? Is it more correct to is it more correct to approach the scriptures in a way that present life, or is it more correct to present the scriptures in a way that makes sense to you? Which one? Because many times when you read a commentary from the fathers, it may not make sense to you, but it can be life giving, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So people want to default to like. That doesn't make sense to me. This one makes sense to me. Therefore, it must be correct. But it, it's not spiritually benefiting you, right? Do, right. Do, are you following what I'm saying? Well, because yeah. what, because you may not be, this is coming, if you're reading something from the fathers, if you're reading commentary from the fathers, then that that's coming from somebody who's highly, at a high level of purification. Mm -hmm. So if you don't understand it, it's actually your bad. It's no. not their yeah. Correct. <laughs> right? It is your bad. That's but people won't bad. see it that way, right? Yeah. People won't see it that way. They're like, oh, well, of course, he's speaking to people in the sixth century. This doesn't apply to me. And, yeah. and they didn't really understand for Copernicus. And like, whatever the thing is going to be, mm -hmm. right? There's this thought that, you know, I think one of the things, the, the undercurrent that I see is... And, and I'm, I'm glad that for whatever reason, it's a blessing, I guess, in my life, for whatever reason, I, this was never a part of my consciousness, but I do see this constantly, is this idea that spread that like somehow people today, like that we are different. Yeah. The generations born today are like different than people have ever been. Like it's a totally new and different humanity. And it's like, no no like you're the you're the same like it's it's not i mean there's if it's different right? it's only because it's worse and it's not, if it's yeah, different exactly. it's not because it's better or more enlightened it's because it's weaker more selfish more entitled more disobedient 
more rebellious. Yeah. And Cyprian, to reference something that you said quite a long time ago, it's just the suit is different. It's just that the suit is different on this on this time in humanity. And um, I have a question, Father, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to derail the conversation, but when you're talking about this ultra correctness, is this something different than like Phariseeism? Or is this no, no. That you're talking about? Okay. Mm-mm. So this ultra correctness, this need to tithe your mint. The, like, yeah, the ultra correctness is straining out the gnat, but slowing a camel. Sure. Okay. So it's like the tithing of your time and your mint and everything, but like leaving the poor is like, isn't that like, that's like a, uh, that's something, you know, that's something it's making sure you're tithing your herbs, but like forgetting the poor or whatever. I mean, yeah. I mean, you could, that that's a part of it. I think the thing I'm trying to get at is the correctness is fundamentally tied to the hubris. Sure. And then I, uh, I would be remiss if I, because it's something that you said, a while ago but i can't remember but that when you said that like this um hubris is ultimately like demonic this lack of respect is ultimately like you're like well for lack of a better word or i don't know what other word to use besides demonic i mean it would be because like demons always afflict the proud so if there's like this pride happening here if there's like this like oh we're starting to figure it out we're starting to get it we're getting closer and closer then like naturally like they ain't gonna be far behind so like they're right there but um i had this thought there's i mean this is the, the, it's just a kind of fun little speculation right but what happens when you have a large portion of a society which is just infected not humankind is is infected in general with hubris and pride right it's one of the, but what happens when the governors that traditionally have like kept that at bay to some degree are gone, right? What ha- what happens when those things? Definitely, there's a lawlessness that that can begin to happen. We're seeing that, right? The the brazenness with some of the crimes that are happening on the coasts, right? Which will eventually come to the Midwest, like like that that type of brazenness is definitely like a symptom of it because it's it's a pride there, right? Nobody can touch me. Right, who's going to do the it? metaphorical, even the metaphorical or figurative lawlessness as well, mm-hmm. like the gender stuff, mm-hmm. right? That it's like even the natural laws are mm-hmm. no, there's not going to be that. Na- we're not going to do natural laws anymore. Right. We don't have to abide by those. Right. Well, Cyprian, I mean, you just you went right exactly where I was going to next because I was going to go to this this kind of natural lawlessness and the throwing off of of categories and boundaries, right? Mm-hmm. That that help define reality, which allows people to maintain sanity right? This is getting to some really scary stuff because, um, and, and I don't know, maybe I've crossed the threshold where I'm officially old, but, I don't, but you know what? I don't think so, man. I, I really, I really don't think so. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm old, but like, I, it's not, that's not it, you know? There's, there's a qualitative shift that's begun, and it's been it's being accelerated by things like obviously social media, the ability for people to pure the ability for people to peer into things that they have no business peering into, right? Let me unpack this a little bit. I've gone back and forth on this, and this is where I'm at on it now. I I I don't know. I'll talk to my spiritual father. I'll see if he corrects me. We'll see what happens. But I'm at a place right now, and some of you may, may this may sound familiar for some of them. I, as much as I love the scriptures, I, I'm really feeling like, you know, I think for some people, they're not really, they really shouldn't be reading the scriptures. I think for some people, they're better off reading the lives of the saints. I'm one of them, I think. Scriptures- I've, encountered, I've encountered some people this week where it was like, don't and these are not orthodox but as i was yeah. like you need catechism you need a priest yeah. stop reading the bible because yeah. it's really bad yeah it's 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 really bad and 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 one of the things i really kind of want to go there about this you know go there with this is is this idea of when you when you are fed when when people are fed this on um, this this fuel to basically just, you know, 
have this sense of, of hubris become unbridled, right? You give someone the ability to memorize or quote scripture or whatever, and, and there's no context there, that becomes very dangerous. Because what, what they are internalizing is, I mean, heresy fundamentally, because it's their opinion, right? But they're, they're, they're internalizing a whole disposition, not just, a prop, not just an improper um, kind of like interpretation, but a disposition. Do you guys understand what I'm saying here? Mm -hmm. they're, they're internalizing a disposition and that internalized disposition is so dangerous because it, there, it then allows someone to now see what is evil as good and what is good evil. And that's what's, that's what's frightening to me in that sense is for many people, this disposition that they begin to imbibe, it, 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 it goes unchecked. And it oftentimes goes unchecked because it's under the guise of, you know, spirituality or religion or whatever, right? But it's, it's a hubris. It's a hubris that is antithetical to the authentic spiritual life. Hey, Father, I have a question that totally Cyprian and I asked before. I was uh, going to remind you right now. This is, this is so on point. Is the concept of pre lest is that just for Orthodox folk? Is that a condition that falls upon a person once they're baptized? Because pre-baptism, most everyone's in deception. Is that a different type of deception than pre lest or is pre lest specifically de designated for Orthodox folk? And then everything else is another type of deception. That's a good question. I, my answer is going to be purely speculative. I'll, I'll have to go back and try to see if I can get a more authoritative answer. But I'm going to go ahead and say, right, it is a, I feel much more comfortable having it being understood in a general sense within the Orthodox context. Because you could say everyone outside of the church is in prelist. Oh, am I saying it wrong? Prelist. Prelist, prelest, whatever, right? But then when you move into it, because the, because the context for, it, for us is this idea, right? Where someone has fallen into this delusion, right? So we, we could say everyone's already in there, right? Um, but I would have to really suss that out. I couldn't, I couldn't give right now. It's just speculation. But um, Well, would there be a way, I mean... Is there a way for outside of Orthodox tradition and outside of an Orthodox context, context to even try to approach, to think that you're even going to approach Christ? Yes. You're going to be in, like, you're yes. going to be in spiritual delusion no matter what you do. Yes, there is a way, though. Okay. There is a way. And the way is humility. Aha, nice. Jinx, you owe me a Coke. <laughs> <laughs> right the the way is humility and that's what all of us have encountered mm -hmm. if it wasn't we wouldn't be in the church now mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right and 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 that's why prelist is so sad and tragic because at one point in time you said yeah i don't know teach me initiate me and now you think you know and that's the madness of hubris. That's the madness of pride, right? So, yeah, that, well, and I mean, that right back to, right back to tradition and the depth of tradition, because how, like, clearly, even, even without seeing the volumes and volumes and volumes, somebody knows, somebody can look at the church and look at the, the depth of the tradition and even to look at contemporarily the people in the church fathers who are there who are who are speaking the elders the things that are being said and it's like there's 2000 years of that mm -hmm. like there's it's the depth has got to be there so for somebody to pop up and be like oh, i got it never mind mm -hmm. like i've got it i've got it figured yeah. out it's like man come on especially from just reading and thinking not not from you know an actual visitation of a of a a saint or Christ himself, like, no, 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 not that. No. Just reading the scriptures and I've got no. it. 
I mean, I there was there's a, a gentleman in the parish, you know, I would talk with him about this in regards of you know, folk in the neighborhood, right? And this idea of pride again, where and this is something I mean, this really breaks my heart because I've seen this in real time where someone will, you know, the the passions are all linked up to each other, right? They they feed and build off of each other. You know, gluttony is connected to lust. Lust is connected to gluttony. But envy, jealousy, they're connected to pride, right? And so you see this where people will be like, you know, I'm not going to listen to him. Who's he, right? Who, 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 who does he think he is, right? And a lot of times people, I've seen this where guys are just all but illiterate. Like literally they're illiterate. They can barely read, right? And then somebody like, who's he think he is trying to tell me to be a boss, whatever. It's like, you can't even read. Like mm-hmm. you, and, and the problem isn't that you can't read. The problem is that you're going to be arrogant about this. I tell my I tell my kids this. I go, look, if you're going to be dumb, you better be humble. <laughs> because there's nothing worse than someone who's dumb and doesn't know, but they can't be humble about it. Most people, right? Most people be like, hey, man, cut you some slack. Like, if you're humble, the, the world is your oyster. Yeah. You can be dumb as a sack of a sack of sandwiches. And people will be like, hey, like, it's all good because he's a humble guy. We like him, right? Can you imagine watching Forrest Gump and that guy starts being like, you know what? I don't think you know what you talk. Like, can you imagine that? Who would want to watch that? 10 minutes in, you're like, okay, this guy, this guy is clearly, you know, challenged. And on top of that, I can't stand him because he's just so arrogant. You'd shoot the TV. You couldn't handle it. Was it was the humility of the character that, that makes the whole thing. It's the humility wonderful. of the character character that makes the whole thing work. Yeah. You, 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 right? So mm-hmm. this is the thing. And it's just like, I can't say enough about it. I can't say enough about it because, look, what drives me absolutely bananas is that all of our problems come from a lack of humility. How is God going to solve all of it? Well, here's what I know. There's a kingdom, and everyone who's going to be in that kingdom is going to have humility. And whoever doesn't have humility, I can't help you out. I don't know what to tell you, but it ain't going to be good. Well, let me ask you this, Father, because this is, this is since I get these two hours with you every week, it's, it's very nice. I, so this is something, this is for me, this is a completely selfish, uh, but, but maybe since there are some other people out there, this has been something, and even, you know, I mean, this is something that I pray on constantly because I mean, as I've said before, I have not had a lot of practice in my life at humility. I, and I, I know that I have not been a humble person and um, you know, that's been part of what people understand about me, I think. You know what I mean? I'm not, I don't think I'm terribly arrogant, but I'm, I also, I know that I, I lack humility in a lot of things and have, have suffered, I'd still suffer with a great uh, deal of pride. But there, I guess my question is like, I will, I will sometimes, you know, see like, oh, I haven't been, okay, I could practice more humility in this scenario. And then I will, I guess, be more humble or whatever. And, but then the pride hits me. Like, then I get the sense of pride, like, oh, well, look how humble you're being. Like, isn't that wonderful? Like, you're such a humble, you're such a humble guy now. And I'm like, why, why stop? No, because now the, the pride. So it's like, what's the, what's the approach? What's the approach to that? I'm not, I'm not trying to trade humility for pride, man. Yeah. And Ignatius Branchino talks a lot about that in his self-accusation. And it's like, if the, the thought comes, it's, oh, that's silly. Uh, oh, look how, look how humble you're being. Oh, that's silly. Oh, I'm not, I'm not humble. Like just that, just that. I mean, I'm not, I don't know. I mean, I'm just saying. Yeah. That, I mean, not, not Andrew's, good. Andrew's on point. Like this maybe gives us into a discussion, which we can do whatever we want, I guess, but it gives us a discussion about the thoughts. And I think this is, there are some key things that I think are just fundamental to, to orthodoxy, right? I mean, um, iconography, right? Um, 
humility, um, you know, this, this understanding of, of, of uh, you know, of course, salvation, Christ, don't get me wrong, right? But like, there's these aspects in which we enter into things. One of the things here in particular is the battle with the thoughts, right? Because for us, we, God forbid, we're like the Pharisees in, in the kind of like whitewashed tombs, right? But inward is full of dead man's bones, right? Like, this is a thing that I think is key because in order to answer your question, Cyprian, we have to address thoughts and how are we to, how are we to or not engage with thoughts, right? The fathers call them logismi, right? And these, these intrusive thoughts that come, right? And they come and they, they seek to supplant us from the virtue that we're, that we're trying to engage in Christ, right? And so, when these thoughts come, right, you can, there's more, there's a couple of different ways to approach it, but the biggest thing is to understand, well, number one, you need guidance, right? So I'm guiding you, but like, you either A, don't make a landing pad for it. This is St. Paisios, right? Or, you know, B, you can, you can engage them head on, right? The first one is a lot easier to do and, and the much more advisable is just to be just like Andrew said, like St. Ignati says, oh, that's silly. Just ignore it. Let it let it pass. Don't engage it. Right. But for some people. Right. And it's they're getting fewer and fewer. But for some people, a direct engagement can be helpful. Right. We can be like, huh. Well, that's just a downright wrong thought. <laughs> right. Like you can, you can actually, you can actually go in there and just, you know, what I call atom smash it, just like obliterate the thing, right? And you'd be like, oh, how how absurd to even think that, right? And like, you know, you cannot say, um, not saying he's not a saint, excuse me, um, but Evagoras, who's like the kind of, um, like the uncle, like the godfather of of monasticism, um, he he talks at length about this, right? And he has a whole process that has been coined, you know, there's a great book, but talking back in which you, this is getting back to the scriptures, didn't even mean to do this, but he talks about the use of scripture in regards of combating these thoughts, right? And, and just being, because here's the secret, a lot of those thoughts aren't you actually. I was going to ask about this. They yeah. are, they are things that they're, they are, long-standing thoughts that you have engaged with and imbibed if you've brought them within you you've given consent to them right and now over time they begin to you know give you the sense that they are you that this is this is me this is my thought right and these are very pernicious things to get out when when these thoughts have been accepted this is where people get quote unquote neuroses you know what I mean? It's from these long-standing, long-standing accepted thoughts. So when we're pursuing a virtue and we find that this thing comes in to supplant us, um, St. John Climacus in his in the latter on the chapter on vainglory, it, it's very, it's very helpful in this area. But when those thoughts come in, um, I would say practically, you know, either A, don't make a landing pad for them or just smash it and be like, oh, you devil, get out of here, whatever, you know? But here's another thing that you can do. You can actually take that, right? And this is, by the way, the proper use of anger. The fathers teach us that anger is given to us, the rascal part of the soul is given to us to, to combat these, these violations, right? To get angry and say like, this is not of God, however it is, and, and, just, and deal with it in that force of, of anger. That's a proper use of anger, right? But the other thing I was going to say is, this is where things like almsgiving comes into place, mm. right? Because almsgiving gets you out of your head and it gets you into this place of, ex of expressing and experiencing. And there's a whole different kind of grace that comes with almsgiving when you're struggling with, with pride, if you're struggling with this kind of back and forth, right? So, so let me give you a scenario, right? Um, this guy's clickety-clackety, keyboard warrior, 
he's blowing you up, Cyprian, you're stupid, you don't know nothing, blah, 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 la, 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 whatever, okay? And like, okay, boom, boom, you back and forth with this guy. And then finally the Holy Spirit's like, hey, you know what? Relax, whatever. And so you, and so you do that. He keeps giving you, he gives you a real good zinger. Boom, whatever. And you're like, ah, I want to serve this guy his lunch. But you're like, you know what? A couple of days go by, someone hits you up, you know, clickety clackety, hey. I saw that, you know, Clown Boy Zero was giving you a hard time and just like, I want to say that like, good on you, man, for like not going after him, you know? And you're like, that's what's up. Yeah, yeah. This has happened. This has right? happened. This that's is what's a, up, right? Not a hypothetical. <laughs> right, right. So you're like, that's what's up. Okay, that's good. That's good. And so the thing is, is now, whatever it is, something tips you off to it in your prayer or your reading, you're like, okay. And you, re you recognize the habit of him catching that thought, right? But now that you're aware of the thought is there, if you're following me, it's almost like, well, dang. It's like, I can't unsee this thought now. Mm -hmm. Now that I've like rejected it. Well, here's what you do, right? You're like, I don't want, okay. I can't just like, it's not, I can't push it away, whatever. Alms. Go give some alms, right? Go give some alms the giving of the alms in secret right like no getting on gofundme and being like hey i'm leaving your name and be like hey i'm the one who like like secret 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 the giving of alms in secret brings health to the soul the giving of alms in secret brings about a grace and in that grace you'll be able to now you know pursue prayer, pursue things that can really kind of like deal with that thought, right? But this is one of the things about being orthodox is that we don't kind of like think and talk about prayer, we pray. We don't think and talk about alms, we give alms. Like we have to actually go into the experience. And when we, and, and, and when we do that, grace really does come, come to us. And it really frees us from these vicious cycles that we get caught in. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense. And I feel it too. Like the second that you said, give alms, it was like, ding, 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 ding. Like immediately, like the bells went off, like, oh, that's, that'll work. Hey, Father, that'll for those not familiar, what's giving alms? Like it's a fairly common concept, but you know. Just yeah, yeah. Giving alms is, is the giving of any charitable act. Primarily, we understand it with the giving of some sort of material, um, some sort of material, um, money food you know but but giving alms can also be time and i mean there's so many ways but it's it's a, some some sort of sacrificial charitable act the, let me give everyone another another trick the the more sacrificial the better the more sacrificial the better it should sting a little bit right in order for it to have that real kind of efficacious right so i point to the lord when he talks about these gave out of their abundance, but she gave out of her, her poverty, talking about the widow and her might, right? Like there is grace when we give abundantly. And, and, and again, it's not just about like, you know, ones and zeros money, although like, yeah, right? But um, I'm just saying, right? Just give an example. You going and mowing, that the neighbor's lawn who's old and you know she can't do it like you doing it and just like not making a thing about it that can be a type of alms sure sure you know what i mean mm. but there's some components to it it should sting and it should really be done in secret it, sh it, it has to be done without any type of looking for acknowledgement or even really it being known the opposite of virtue signaling it's the absolute, you know, I, can I just apologize to everyone? I'm sorry. I was in kind of rare form today. Um, I know I was kind of going off. And if I offended anybody uh, unduly, you know, because um, uh, there's all kinds of all kinds of good souls that it's not your fault. You're a millennial. You know what I mean? It's not it, it's not your fault. Like, God bless you. Forgive me for just kind of like getting in for me being a. Uh, what's the term? Uh, Curmudgeon? Curmudgeon. Yeah. Curmudgeon. Forgive me. 
for, for but, I think I think that what millennials, is, but millennials know this, Father. Like, even it's, I think even the ones who would possibly like take offense. It's not that they would take offense because they would be like, "Oh, that's that's wrong." Mm -hmm. I think for most of the ones that I know, it's just like, "Well, you shouldn't have said that." Like it may be true, it may it may be one hundred percent true, but like it was inappropriate for you to say that. Basically. Yeah, I think the millennials I know would say you shouldn't have said that, and it's not my fault I'm this way, and it's yeah. not my responsibility. No, I I am this way, but it's not my fault, and it's so not that's why you shouldn't have said it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I. Yeah. It's all the it's this crappy capitalistic society with these like patriarchal parents that screwed me up for forever. I I do not apologize to millennials. I do not. But no, I'm just kidding. I do. I just I have a particular animosity towards them. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit, and we don't have to dive super into this because I've heard that, and I don't know the truth of this, but like I found this to be a comforting way of looking at logos me. Uh, I heard a priest talk about um, an Orthodox priest talk about one time that there's this Greek philosophy a long time ago that the brain is more of a sensory organ rather than it produces yeah. its own thoughts it's like an eyeball or a yes. you know like a an ear in which it is perceiving things that are around it and so i found that which, to be by the way pause i don't want you to lose it no nope. i want to link it remember how we are how many episodes we're talking about ideas mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that there's i mean that proves it inspiration yeah right. like creative inspiration right. it's not coming from within you sure right? yeah. sorry hubris right like you're receiving it you're receiving it you're perceiving it right book at enoch mm -hmm. book at enoch um so then uh i found that to be comforting because then it is like okay so if i'm constantly like hanging around like a construction site and getting sawdust and like metal filaments around my eye then my eye is going to become unhealthy like, so all I have to do is go find an eye wash station and not hang around that spot without safety glasses on anymore. So then I, I don't necessarily have to own a lot of these thoughts. So St. John of Kronstadt said that when he was serving liturgy, the most blasphemous thoughts would come into his head and, you know, he just would, okay, cool. See ya. Like that's, you know, he would combat them. I mean, it doesn't mean that St. John of Kronstadt was being blasphemous behind the altar. It means that he was being attacked as far as i know correct me father if i'm wrong you're correct um so then if i'm if if i have this really gnarly thought and perhaps those who are not orthodox and who are maybe new to this concept it's not necessarily me like i don't have to i don't like this was one time i was working at that kitchen i was talking about earlier and this lady was just we were in the right middle of a rush and she was really really getting on me about stuff and just kind of yelling at me and i kind of just turned around and was like Mercedes what is going on and she like immediately stopped and then in her silly way she started waving her towel around and saying like get out of here devil like get out of here like I, I don't want to do this to Andrew anymore like this is not necessarily me it's not quite that simple but I thought that that was like a, a comforting way of seeing it's like yeah I can invibe say thoughts thoughts of lust and really let that like reside and hang out within me I can like let that in but like it gets also up to me to also I can stop it too. I can I can say no more. I don't I don't want this anymore. I'm done with that. Right. And I mean, beautiful, Andrew. And um this is the thing that I mean hurts me the most as a as a father is that um and I'm gonna make a bold statement and I'm sorry that I can't re I can't retract this statement, but Christ is not a liar. You know, the the, the truth of what he promises us in, in the life uh, uh, in him, it's true. So um, he doesn't promise us a life filled with wanton pleasure and ease and all those things. That's why he promises us persecution. He promises us, you know, crucifixion, like, you know, picking up our cross and following him daily. He promises those things. But he also promises us, right, that we would have life and life more abundantly. He promises us that in him, right, like we will know truth and we will no longer walk in darkness. Like that, that's what he tells us, right? And so when we are baptized and chrismated, we're given two new eyes to see. 
And those two not those two new eyes, they are the things by which we can begin to perceive this 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 reality of, of the world. And I would and I want to say what breaks my heart is when people believe the lie that they can't push against these things. Right? When they believe the lie that like I, I can't do it. I don't have any hope. Like it's just thought you do you understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Because no, that's just that's not true. That's not true. Am I saying that it, oh, it's easy, just snap your fingers, get over it? I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying, yeah, shed blood, gain the spirit. That's what the fathers teach. Shed blood, gain the spirit, right? So we need to get to this place where, where we will say, I would rather die than dishonor my god i would rather die than you know bring shame like that's how people used to live back in the day just on a natural level i'd rather die than bring dishonor to my family right and not just asian cultures you know what i mean i mean that was just that's the level of just kind of common respect people had you apply that to the things of the spirit you apply that to the kingdom of god you apply that to to the love of your soul who has given you such an incredible gift as the church? Is it tough? Absolutely, it's tough. Will it cost you something? Absolutely, it'll cost you something. But, you know, let every man be a liar. God is true. Like, the fact of the matter is, is like, you've been given that grace to at least fight. To at least fight. God's not concerned with your success. He's he's concerned with your effort, right? We fail and fall a thousand times, right? But we need to get up a thousand and one time. That's it. And I know that sounds cheesy. That sounds, but you know what? It's the difference between someone taking their own life and not. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Or just dying spiritually. Yep. like or just letting themselves die spiritually and yep. Cyprian, i know you want to ask a question so just give me one second do uh, your thing man uh because then to loop it back to the 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 other part of the creed that we're talking about is because there will be a resurrection like you have to be crucified first because then on the third day he rose again and mm-hmm. they like to put it in and everybody's getting resurrected by the way I mean, for better or for worse. For better or for worse, everyone's getting resurrected. And um, I mean, like to put it in AA speech, it's like this too shall pass. Like it's not for forever. And then like, like I tell people and I'm on a bit of a soapbox myself, so I'll step down after this too. But um, it's like I tell people about sobriety. It's like my whole life is not just spent battling the desire to drink. Like I gain things from learning Mm -hmm. how to handle that desire to drink. Mm -hmm. If that were all recovery promised me, I wouldn't be interested in it. I would rather just drink and then be a miserable person because I'd rather be miserable drunk than miserable sober. And like there is misery within sobriety, but like at the same time, like I don't ever think like if someone, I can't imagine trying to practice a real spiritual program while being inebriated the way that I was. It's just not possible. And like, I don't have the fortitude. Yeah. You know, I mean, my guard at the heart at the guard at the door of my heart is drunk. Like, you know, then everybody's going to get in. He's going to be looking for parties. So whoever's bringing the more substances, the more booze he's going to let in. And they got the substances, they got the booze and they're very interested in coming in. So I'm now stepping down. Oh, well it's at, it's it's all on a theme because what the the theme that that was there and it's something that i want to address because I, I don't address it because it i think it's one of the things that maybe made orthodoxy attractive to me or resonate with me is but it's again also i think something that's missing is you know we're talking about these thoughts the negative thoughts or these negative things being from Mm. outside and then being an attack, Mm. but also the positive, the grace, the blessings that's being bestowed is also from the outside. Mm -hmm. I I've never had a problem with that. Like, so for me, that, that piece of this 
was already a, an aspect of my reality because I was seeking out other entities through, in my life. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I always understood that the things were coming in from externally. But what I see so often is both the, the internal and the ex, both the good and the bad, people are saying it's them and they're being told it's them. Mm -hmm. So like something that's good that's happening, oh, it's, it's me that's doing mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. Something bad that's happening, oh, it's me that's doing this. Mm -hmm. You know, something that's a, a, a temptation or whatever, some yeah, thought that they have. That you're at the center of everything, right? That, exactly. <laughs> right, yes. Right. Now, yes. now, now, just to give some nuance to what you're saying, because um, what you're saying is accurate, but I, I want to take this point to explain something that maybe we've talked about it. Um, and I'm sorry if I'm jumping the, the gun, because uh, we would get later on to the creed. This is something we'll talk about again, I guess. But um, this, again, this isn't negating what you're saying, Sabrina, but it, it's, I, I want to go there. And just, if nothing else, almost like a kind of like a little teaser. Please. People need to realize that when you're baptized and chrismated, there's a, there's a transformation that happens. One of them is that um, there's a qualitative distinction you, begin to, you can begin to make about the temptations that come from without and the temptations that come from within. But more importantly to this, I think this is the more, more, most important thing. The Holy Spirit acts externally, but when you're chrismated, the Holy Spirit begins to act internally in a way that's qualitatively different. And this is really important to understand because when that begins to happen, you can, you can tell and know that it's not you, but it is coming from within you. And when you become aware of without prelist, right? That God is working within me, that the kingdom of God is within me, right? You're not saying the kingdom of God is me, right? You're not saying I am, right? You're, you're saying I can, I can now with, with the eye of my heart, with my news, I can see it. And this is really important to understand. We were talking a little bit about this with the conversation earlier today with DPH in regards of this false light that people begin to apprehend. And this is, this is the thing because the scriptures, the things of the church, but in particular scriptures, because people who aren't even in the church, they have access to the scriptures. And let's just be really clear about something. The scriptures belong to the Orthodox church. People have access to them, but the scriptures belong to the Orthodox Church. The Orthodox Church is the one who, who, who canonized, compiled and canonized the scriptures. The Orthodox Church is, I mean, all the saints, you know, the evangelists, they were, they were bishops and, and, and key, they were apostles, they're key cornerstones to, uh, to the church. This is Ephesians, right? The, the foundations of the church are built upon the apostles. Anyways, um, the access to the Holy Scriptures can and does develop a, develop the, in, the inner light, right? Because every human being is made in the image of God, right? But this the inner light can become deceptive to people and they can begin to see it as the source versus the kind of thing that's reflecting, right? Reflecting the light of God from them, right? When you are brought into the church and you receive chrismation and baptism, that same phenomenon is there, but it, it, it changes. It becomes, it becomes different. And there's a, there's a communion that you're brought into. There's a partition that you, particip, or, excuse me, a participation that you are brought into with that light that is qualitatively different than how you were outside of the church, right? And this very much is that kind of external now, now becoming internal, right? And I just want to bring that up because I want to. I want to also lift up the. I always. We always need to lift up the wonder and the good. And I want people to be excited about what the church, not just brings to us, but turns us into. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, because so then I've heard that it's like 
before your baptism it, it's like the dark is within you and then once your baptism the like the holy spirit comes in so then paying attention to outwardly like pokes and prods and stuff like that that can be dangerous i've heard that before i don't remember well we can get into this whole thing about there's these directions in which the in which we are attacked from the front from the back from the left from the right from upwards from below and you can begin to to discern how these attacks come like for instance an attack from behind is uh, is what we would characterize as an attack of temptation of regret right okay. like you're, you're regretting things in the past and you're like looking back things. yeah looking back so this despair. is this a, a metaphor like a, a attack from behind or is it like you feel like a like not to get too into any, anything but like is this like you feel like something in your back and then you like start regret something or is it like no no it, no it's the metaphor of like the temptation gotcha. to look back behind you to regret you know which leads to you know kind of all kinds of depression and things like that you know what i'm trying to get at is you can begin to tell how these attacks come in the form of thoughts, right? And in the, the direction in which the, the thoughts are taking you, it gives you the quality of, of what you're dealing with, right? So a temptation from the front looks like anxiety, right? Because a temptation of the front is like this, this incessant, fearful look into the future and the uncertainty of it. That's what anxiety is, fundamentally. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And for some reason, it seems like the more anxiety you have, the the more control you have over that thing. So if you just fear enough, that thing won't come true or something like that, or that situation will change. Yeah, but that's obviously a lie because the 100%, right? Because the more fear that you have, the more actually you bring about a self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, you're moving towards it. You move toward whatever you're looking at. That's I mean, right. that's just, that's just reality. That's like... That's right. It's actually it's just a reality. You look at it, you to move forward. That's where you're going. You know? That's right. I and, find... and, and let me give you this idea too, for people to this principle. It's not an idea. It's a principle. We become the portal. Maybe we've even talked about this before. I'm sure, maybe, have we talked about this? Like, like, yep. Like we become the portal. So if nothing else, like at the very least, just say to yourself, I don't want to be a portal for this thing, right? I don't want to be a means by which this thing gets to manifest on the material plane. And now I'm, I'm the meat puppet being kind of moved around and, and wrecking people, you know? And that's not even a metaphor, father. Like, that's not even like what you're saying right there is not, that's not a a metaphor. metaphor. No, that's like, I mean that literally. Yeah. 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 I mean that literally. I I don't want to, I I had this thought and we got to wrap up soon because it's getting to be about that time. Yeah, let's do it. Um, but before we do, um, I wanted to ask father, like, so there's this idea of like, okay, so it's sorcery of like manifesting, right? Like I want, I want the executive producer job on whatever show. So I'm going to manifest it, you know, and like, I'm going to manifest it. And like, I put it in my spirit book or whatever it is. Magic. Yeah. So it's magic. Right. But so then all that taken aside, I have this feeling, this inclination sometimes, and of like, if I say something, I'm giving it weight, I'm giving it power. So like, if I'm, I'm afraid of expressing like a fear or a worry, and then I express it. And I had this idea of like, and maybe this is wrong, but like, because demons can't hear your thoughts, or you're like your inner what's going on inside here, they can influence, but like, once it's out of your lips, they know, they're like, Oh, okay. Okay. He's afraid of this thing. He's afraid that like yeah yeah there's there's definitely a portion of that, but I think maybe we've talked about this before too. They're much more be- they they are much more adept at reading other signs, which can which actually can give a can tell your hand sometimes even more than words you utter. Okay, I think they're you're like the, about- they're like the Google and Facebook uh, AI. You know, yeah. that's reading, that's reading just like, well, what yeah. are you looking at? How long are you spending and looking at this thing? That's not a metaphor either. Yeah, it's like, not, like, no, it's not a metaphor. No, These not, are not metaphors. But like, but like, for instance, they can look and they go like, oh, when he looks at this, this one woman, that's not his wife, I can tell that his blood, his, his pulse begins to race, his eyes dilate, there's a little bit of sweat, 
and maybe even getting to the point of seeing how certain blood flows to certain areas of the body, right? They can see all of that. They can read all of that. And that can sometimes be more, much more telling, right? People have nonverbal cues that are much harder for them to get a, to have control over than their, than their tongues, right? So although the demons cannot read our thoughts, they almost don't need to. Yeah. It's like it's like your wife can know you a lot better than you realize because she lives with you and, and just lives with you. She knows like, oh, when you're lying, you begin to tap your foot real quick. That's easy. You know what I'm saying? So they've been, not only have they been studying you your whole life, they've been studying human beings for eons. So yeah, it's, it's pretty serious what we're dealing with. And that's all the more reason why we need to really take seriously the things that the, that the church gives us and like, you know, let us run to the correction that, you know, the church gives us. Cause it's in that correction that we find shelter from these hideous intelligences that are hunting us and preying upon us. All right. And I think we're, we're up on it. We're up on I'm, two hours. I'm going to shift gears a little bit. So so go ahead and just rattle off. Doesn't have to be nothing set in stone. A couple of your favorite guitar solos of all time. Oh, I'm the worst with guitar solos. Uh, or an instrument solo. Doesn't matter what it, it can yeah, be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, Dave Gilmore, um, the solo on um, Comfortably Numb. Um, Jimi Hendrix, the solo on um, Machine Gun. Hmm. Um, Tony Iommi, pick a solo. <laughs> um, oh, Father, I've been meaning to ask, you know the band Cake? Uh-huh. Yeah, have you heard them cover War Pigs? No, I bet oh, it's good, though. I'll send it. They, at the end, it's a trumpet doing the guitar oh, yeah. solo instead of the guitar. Yeah. It's yeah, good. It's, good. It's really, really good. Anyway, sorry. No, it's good. I need to derail you. Cyprian, it doesn't have to be a guitar. It could be any kind of like I can't that. even I can't even think I can't even think of one at this point. Okay. I'm gonna bow out. I want to hear yours. Okay. Um, I mean there's definitely there's definitely I mean there's definitely some Hendrix ones that are obviously sick, but I feel like that's a gimme. If you say if you say I feel like if you say Hendrix, you better have some other ones up your sleeve as well. Right. Or not. Or you could say like what's <laughs> what's Two of the most amazing comic books of all time. Well, Dark Knight Returns and The Watchmen. Everybody's going to say yeah, that. It's enough, like if you're a certain enough. level of comic book, it's like, well, because it's fantastic. Jimi Hendrix fair is like the level of like being there of like, well, no, it's raw. It, it's the dude's like using it as like this big, clunky, chuggy, awesome thing. Um, Let's hear yours. I would say there's um there's a death metal band from Germany, I think. I think they're from Germany called Necrophagist. Uh, they have this famous um, fermented awful discharge is the name of the song and oh it's really cool is if anybody gets a wild hair up their butt and they want to look it up there's a guy who covers it on a clarinet and it's That's absolutely really insane I think I showed that to you one time father and uh, the shredding is intense like it's all sweeps you know it, it's it, mm -hmm. it sounds amazing it's well done it's groovy it's just like a really 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 well done um guitar solo and then um there's a band i really really love i've loved for a really long time and i would encourage anybody um who's semi-spiritual to check out me without you um they're a really fantastic band uh one of those other bands that he definitely came into contact with orthodoxy at a certain point he has a lot of the language i don't think he's stuck with it but he's got a really raw and real relationship with god in some sense i mean you know he doesn't have the fullness of it but you can tell this man struggles with god in a pretty open and honest way but his brother is the guitar player and his brother um has this like really amazing way of like this definition of just less is more guitar work he a lot of times i can describe him more as like being like an ambient guitar player because he just does the, like these little licks these little like grooves in the background while the other person's doing this like chord progression or whatever Mike, his guitar, his brother, the lead singer's brother, 
just does these cool but there's this they released this album they broke up they're breaking up but they had this their last album uh, just called untitled there's this um song on there it's the big club banger from the album is called julia and he has this like it's just like this groovy driving song the entire time there's like harmonized vocals throughout the entire mm. thing and then mike comes in like three minutes in just like Bam! oh then this is the last one because there's probably five or six of them by mike mike by michael weiss alone um but there is this the album before that called pale horses uh a lot of those guys a lot of guys who were into me that you stopped on brother sister uh it's an album and i would encourage them to keep going because they only get better but that's neither here nor there um they really uh this album called pale horses and there's a song that um the beginning of the album starts with these like notes it's the guitar players like playing and then they come back around the last song is the same mm. notes and mm. the whole song is about um is about the final judgment and like mm. uh so it's all soft and he's like uh no more oh god gave god gave noah the rainbow signs no more water it's the h-bomb next time and then like mm. like these like lines about like how like we're progressing lower and then it gets really quiet and it's just this heart playing and then they come with like the most rocking guitar riff and then michael or aaron weiss is just screaming lines from Le revelation and like talking about christ returning with the sanctified sword and like it's like that nee, 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 nee. like that you know like like that like really like just chuggy like stoner rock like and it's just absolutely out of this world it's like a, the one of the most epic things i've ever heard um but my now i gotta check it out you've sold me yeah that <laughs> I'm sold. I'm like this. <laughs> I mean, explore that band's whole discography. I mean, if you're at a certain level, and there's complaints to be made about the band, without a doubt. Like uh, a lot of people find the lead singer's vocal style to be kind of aggravating because he just yells. He doesn't scream. He just well, like, no, no, yells. don't don't take it back. Don't take it back now. You can't. <laughs> don't don't try to. <laughs> I, after the after I the sale, nothing, don't try to. Like, <laughs> don't don't try to just manage my expectations now like after the sale i gotta now i gotta just let me do it just let me go i'll send you it. rainbow signs and if do you it like send it i want one, it. if you like rainbow okay signs, i would encourage you to check out all the other stuff because like okay. he also has this sim oh am i done i'm sorry father i'm sorry <laughs> i i drank tea and i got really excited talking about me but send like, it to me <laughs> yeah. um that and necrophages and then there's a million others i'm going to remember tomorrow but that's all right so um anyway that's our show thanks everybody sorry i got so hyped about me without you at the end but i'm sure i'm gonna go back and i'm gonna look and there's gonna be this like twinkle in my eye because i'm talking about them that, like, no it's there it's there it's there <laughs> like my face will look so like happy and like they're just so they're so so good so Anyway, guys, thanks for having a good night. Or no, thanks for not. Well, or thanks for having a good night. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.